Hello, everyone, uh, for, and welcome to this uh, panel on thinking about the future uh, and pioneering directions uh, for Web3. Uh, we are joined by some esteemed speakers who are not only thinkers in this space, but you know, they are deep in the field. Uh, so we'll spend the next 30 minutes uh, talking about what they're doing, uh, what the challenges are, what's holding us back, and what a glorious decade uh, you know, coming up can, can look like. So I'll encourage all my panelists to kind of introduce yourself uh, and uh, just in a minute or two, and we'll come back and talk about your opening statements. I guess I will start. My name is Anders Brownworth. I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, these are my opinions, not the opinions of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston or the Board of Governors or anything like that. Um, so uh, I have a background in crypto. I got into it in uh, about 2010 and uh, uh, worked a lot at uh, Circle. We started USDC and a number of other projects. And uh, more recently, I moved over to the Federal Reserve to look at what this technology can do in a centralized context. Like, how can you actually scale this stuff uh, and, you know, sort of meet sort of world scale rather than, uh, you know, sort of the, the maybe seven transactions a second you might see on, on public permissionless blockchains. So that's what I'm doing. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Winter. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Reach. I personally have been in, in crypto since 2013 and investing back then. 2015 is when I started building and been running companies full time since 2017. I'm extremely passionate about blockchain. I believe that blockchain is needed to fix the world. Um, and the scary thing is that blockchain has a potential of being doomed, uh, mainly because there's not enough developers in the space. Uh, uh, Andreessen just recently put out a, a report saying there's about 6,000 developers that are building full-time. Um, compare that to Web2, where there's 25 million. There's zero chance that we'll be able to get to where Web2 is unless we actually fix this problem. And that's what my company, Reach, does. Uh, we have built a in-to-end -in blockchain development platform that completely changed the, changes the paradigm of what blockchain development does, uh, or is, to... Um, be able to actually lower the bar of entry, but also raise the bar of potential. And uh, yeah, we did that by building a, an our entire own uh, programming language, compiler, and deployment tool. Uh, we've now over onboarded over 6,800 developers that have actually built and compiled decentralized applications. And uh, we sit around uh, between 600 and 700 uh, monthly active developers, which if you look at the same injuries and reports, that puts us at about around the third largest blockchain development community in the world behind Solana. And we did it at a quarter amount of time and um, with, you know, not with all of the money in the world like they have. So, and that's purely because we've made it so that those 25 million developers have the ability to actually build real things in blockchain. And that is what is needed to actually really make blockchain, you know, meet its potential. And my name is Taylor Robel. Uh, I've been working at OpenSea as an engineering manager and platform engineer for the last eight months. Uh, tomorrow is actually my last day. So much like Anders, my opinions are my own. They do not reflect those of, of OpenSea. Um, but yeah, being more sort of on the engineering side, I think for the last eight months, I've been really down in the trenches, uh, you know, figuring out what it takes to make a really successful Web3 company scale and the types of performance issues that you can run into when you have an idea that just gets wildly popular overnight um, and seeing sort of how the community has responded as the platform has scaled and the issues that we've run into as we scaled over time. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the future of NFTs generally uh, and Web3 in general as well. Uh, I'm Anastasia Bez. I run operations at Cadena. Uh, we're a layer one blockchain. Uh, people are building on top of us. We have our own smart contract language. Uh, I'm also an advisor to Cadena Eco, which is our um, fund initiative for bu building out our ecosystem. So getting more people to onboard um, different projects. And yeah, I have a background in civil liberties research other than this and an interest in the arts. Hey everyone, my name is Jerry Shao. Um, I'm an engineer at Solana Labs. Uh, like a, a few of the other panelists have mentioned, my opinions are my own and not of my company. Um, but my job primarily focuses on doing innovative research and development and smart contract building. Recently, the thing that I've been focusing on is trying to compress NFTs so that the data cost for storing one is approximately zero. 
Um, we think that like because the current footprint for NFTs is relatively expensive and either gas costs or storage costs, uh, these digital assets will be unlikely to support uh, millions to hundreds of millions of users in the future. So in order to scale that uh, so that it can have widespread appeal and widespread use, we think that is really important to sort of minimize that cost. So that's what I've been focusing on primarily in my engineering work. Um, other than that, I spend time doing educational outreach as well as developer relations at Solana Labs. Fantastic. This is a, this is a hopefully we're going to get a lot of doers and maybe conflicting opinions on, 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 on a bunch of questions. So I'll start with the first one, which is what is being done today and what you're seeing coming you know, in the next few years that's built on top of blockchain, that's innovative, and can be used in new sectors? Well, sure, I'll jump in because like, what can be used? Let's just go in a circle. That's kind okay. of the question. So what can be used is, uh, uh, you know, these, these technologies have, have shown a, a lot of promise. The question is, you know, kind of what could you do to really scale it? What could you parallelize? What do you, you know, what could you really, you know, reach if, if you kind of pulled all the unimportant pieces off and just had sort of like the flying gas can, as you know, in a sense. Um, you know, you can take these things and, and uh, force them to extremes. So for example, uh, you might be used to uh, 20 transactions a second or so on, on uh, Ethereum or, you know, 30, 60,000 or so on Solana. Um, but what could that technology really go to if you actually just, you know, did as much as you could. And it turns out that, uh, you know, in a centralized context, you could, you, that's essentially unlimited. Um, we've shown up to 1.7 million transactions a second, and there's no reason to believe it won't go way faster than that. Um, we've also scaled uh, uh, virtual machines up to that uh, kind of a, a rate too. So yeah, I think it's really kind of cool what you can do. The speed and scale. So I think the actual problem is that literally everything on blockchain is innovative today because it has to be. The, we are so early that everybody has to rebuild the wheel, rebuild every single tool, and do everything from scratch. Be and that's also the problem because it takes so long to actually build these innovative things that nobody's actually provided any value of blockchain yet. I say that with you know, a heavy heart because I truly love the potential of blockchain. But you can't really say that the blockchain has actually added value to the world yet. I think that this will come, and I think that's, that the, once, I, once again, like I said earlier, the world needs it. But in, until people, what I, what I like to say is until blockchain becomes so easy that people start building fart apps on blockchain, the true innovation that will make the world a better place will not come. And it might not come unless we actually make it so that those 25 million people can actually do, do something on blockchain. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at other sectors, like going back all the way to the beginning of TV, uh, people thought the best way to use TV is to just take Broadway shows and broadcast them. You know, just time and space shifted. So you can be in the middle of the country and watch Broadway shows from New York. And then quickly everybody realized, especially the artists and designers realized, that actually it's a much more powerful medium and TV is something completely different than just watching Broadway show. So do you feel like some of these concepts are kind of a, you know, a caged lion that we know, even if you kind of put the lion out of the cage, it doesn't know where to go. It just kind of does the same thing it would have done otherwise, like the world we are, we are in with blockchain. I 100% believe that. I think that a lot of things that we're actually building right now, uh, one thing that actually really comes to mind is NFTs. Uh, NFTs, people are buying silly JPEGs and spending a lot of money on this. But the excitement is the actual technology behind these NFTs and not really necessarily the actual pictures people are, are building. Um, I like to actually really break down what an NFT really is and I call it um, self-sovereign ownership. And it's self-sovereign ownership with the ability to bake in rules around the, what it means to own and what it actually means to transfer. And the, it, this is one of those things where the, the infrastructure, the, the potential is the technology is it's so much greater than actually what it's being used for right now, and people are just starting to scratch the surface of what it can actually be. But I thought you said nothing was built of value. I, Did I, you not? Oh, I 100% I agree with that. Really? That's, I, I, I disagree. There's no way. You believe that the blockchain has made the world a, a, a better place at the, the grand scale of things? I, I believe public permissionless blockchains have, have been a net benefit for society, yes. 
a net benefit, but how big is it actually? Did it actually you could, change the, the world? Simple, the simple way to do it is to say, well, what is the value of the ecosystem? Take all the tokens and multiply them by the value. The, uh, you know, you could, you could write off a million dollars. You could write off a billion, maybe 10 billion, probably not a hundred billion, a thousand billion. I can't write off a trillion dollars. Somebody thinks there's value there. Uh, you know, so, so the economic system is looking for better, faster, cheaper, right? And this has the potential to deploy, to supply that. Oh, I agree. You better in, said potential. I said it does, hasn't added yeah. value yet. Okay, so, so nobody's done an escrow transaction trustlessly? Not enough to actually make the world a better place. No, I, <laughs> well, yeah, you I said mean, none. I think that we're uh, definitely ahead. already seeing value being added uh, in NFTs in particular to some degree, uh, clear bias having worked at OpenSea. Um, but I would actually say we're going to see a lot more of that given the current cooldown. Uh, sort of the, the decrease in the average sale price of an NFT means that people are no longer viewing them as you know purely collectibles and purely things that they're buying to hold on to and then hopefully resell at some point. You're starting to see a lot more utility. So there are projects out there like After Party that are starting to seriously look at doing you know venue tickets uh, as NFTs, looking at the secondary sales market that currently is completely dominated uh, by Ticketmaster and, and similar sites. And you know we've got additional things like Courtyard where you're able to facilitate the physical exchange of goods where you'll send them a physical good they'll exchange it for an NFT, and then you can do all of your secondary sales purely digitally without needing to worry about re-verifying the authenticity of that good, worrying about getting it damaged in transit as you move it around with each sale, and then whenever you want it, you can burn the NFT and get the physical good back out. I think those are very tangible, actual problems with a lot of current marketplaces, and by putting a digital medium in between to, to facilitate that, you are seeing a net benefit. I'm, I agree that there's tons of potential. Like, this is what you guys are. This both is saying. potential. So, These are there right now. If I, if I can, if I can rephrase how Chris is saying, I think Chris is one of the points you're making is unless it touches something physical, it's just oh. in the digital world. It has some some impact. I'm when, I'm purely when it saying. Sort of physical, the value multiplies exponentially. I'm purely saying that the potential of blockchain is so great that we have even come close to actually scratching the true value of what it is. And when I say that there is no value here, I don't mean there is no value. Obviously, there, like I've, I've made swaps and made money and I've done things of that sort, that's value. But I'm talking about like world-changing value. And when you look at it like that, blockchain hasn't done that yet. I know that there's potential with NFTs. I love NFTs. I've done entire talks about what NFTs can do. But I'm talking about like, I'm here to make sure that the entire population in the world is better off because of blockchain. And that's what I truly care about. And Asisha was actually in civil liberties before she switched over to Kadena. So go for it. Not to put you on the spot. I mean, what I was going to say was more that I think that for widespread adoption, blockchain is actually going to need to become invisible to people because you shouldn't necessarily see that you're interacting with blockchain if you're a casual user. You know, when my mom wants to make an NFT, she shouldn't have to go through 17 different steps and like backflip through MetaMask in order to be able to upload a piece of art. And so I, I agree that we are in the nascent stages of what it's going to take to have widespread appeal and adoption. Like everyone here is very enthused and excited and is adept at using, you know, complex technical tools. But for us to be able to do something that's really game changing, we're going to need a lot more than that. And we're going to need customization. So, you know, could in a smart contract language, you can customize royalties in at the smart contract level, which means that it's then marketplace agnostic. So it's sort of getting to this, giving people tooling so that they can like shape their own destiny and, and control what they're doing with, you know, information, art, finances as, as they decide. Yeah, going back to the original question about like what innovation has already like been done in blockchain, I think that the idea of a blockchain itself is like quite fascinating, right? It's like a really tough distributed sense, a distributed systems problem, and in doing so, we have this sort of like verifiable settlement layer that we can do stuff with, right? That enables things like NFTs, that enables things like DeFi. Um, one of the biggest innovations that I think that like uh, has been touched upon is like this function of a swap, right? Now you can have instantaneous settlement of your assets. Um, which I think is really cool, and like that's something that didn't exist like more than three years ago. Um, so like, there's plenty of innovation that's going on in this space. Um, whether or not that sort of like uh, actualizes itself into real-world tangible value, I think it's only really a matter of time. But I also 100% agree with Anastasia's point about like 
uh, crypto UX, right? Because if we're crypto native, it makes a lot of sense for us to sort of go through the motions of like clicking through wallets and signing transactions, but it's not necessarily the world's most intuitive interface. I think for crypto to reach like a lot of people, um, the main things that need to like change are like one, costs need to go down. So it can't, can't be prohibitively expensive to use blockchains, but also um, it's really important that the experience doesn't feel like you're using crypto. It should feel like you're using Robinhood or it should feel like you're using Instagram. These are applications that like people have grown Ad adapted to and uh, UX designers have spent lots of time sort of catering the experience so the user finds it like relatively seamless and uh, blockchain is not there yet. I would say that because blockchains are immutable there is a risk of making the user experience too smooth and too easy. Right? We already see blind click-throughs on wallets all the time where people aren't really verifying that they're buying what they think they're buying or that they're interacting with the entity that they think they're interacting with. This is a huge issue when it comes to phishing and just overall trust and safety on Web3. And I think if we do make that process too seamless without any way to you know, undo an operation that was made in mistake, we're gonna be in a really rough situation when it comes to trying to get the general population to trust Web3 technologies. I, I think that's a really great point. Um, definitely, we need to be cognizant of the fact that like, because this is an immutable ledger, right? there could be actions that are irreversible. So certainly, a lot of precautions need to be take, uh, taken to make sure that like, these types of things don't affect users in a really negative way. Um, I do find that the most, uh, the most like, pleasant experiences on Web3 are things that sort of hybridize like, existing solutions in Web2. Like, they use centralized servers and centralized databases to uh, cater to the user's experience, but the back end is still running on the blockchain, right? That's the kind of experience I think will sort of drive the future, where like the underlying application itself is still sort of your typical Web 2 um, front end and some back end, but the overall data storage and like the, the settlement layer does exist on like L1. Very good point. Uh, that takes us to the, actually the next question, which is what are some things that are holding us back or blockers? I think UX is something that you mentioned. Uh, but things that people are not talking about. People are talking about regulation and all the other things, but let's talk about things that are not commonly discussed. Uh, in my keynote earlier uh, this morning, uh, I talked about four things that need to happen if you have to graduate Web3 into a decentralized AI platform. Uh, and I talked about CrowdX, you know, so the, the, the notion that it's not user experience, but a crowd experience. When I use something like Waze or Google Maps, it's not just experience I'm getting for myself, but also see what other people are getting as an experience because I see where others are and what kind of traffic is for them. So I get a crowd experience as opposed to a user experience and, and that could be one challenge. The other three things I talked about was instead of just pseudo anonymity, we need to create a no peak uh, privacy platform that's common in other scenarios but not available in, in blockchain yet. And the other two things were about verifiable AI as opposed to just verifiable transactions uh, as well as uh, creating um, uh, as well as creating, um, uh, you know, data markets where uh, the value of the data is so important, but um, it may not be visible to you before you decide what its value is for exploiting for AI. But what do you think are some blockers and that people are not discussing? Yeah, well, I, I'm, people are probably discussing it, but I think the very base of it is the fact that nobody really knows what you can actually do. Education is a huge limiter, and part of that is because this is bizarre. This is way weird technology, and especially the way that it's applied, if you come to it with a sort of a traditional understanding. Um, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, it's also moving target right now. Like if you, if you make a good educational, you know, uh, uh, some good educational material, it may be outmoded in, in a few minutes. So I think that's a very difficult issue and kind of really need, is at the root of why regulation might not, you know, might take a little longer than we wish and uh, many problems. I believe there's four reasons why that is preventing blockchain um, mainstream adoption. Uh, the first one is uh, what, exactly what you said, is that people don't know what blockchain is for. Um, they, they, you ask people what blockchain is for, they say, you know, immutability, they say decentralization, they say trustlessness. Those are all features of the blockchain and not values of the blockchain. They all provide the value of the blockchain. But there's a, there's a research paper out there, it's one of my favorites, called, called Some Simple Economics of Blockchain. I recommend you all read it. Uh, it's by Joshua Gans and Christian Catalini. And it talks about the true value of blockchain is that it lowers the cost of verification. Um, but I won't get into that exactly, but, um, but read that paper, you'll learn a lot from it. The second major issue is that blockchain development itself is too difficult. 
right now when you want to build a blockchain application, you have to actually write uh, your application at the level of a state machine. This is what they had to do back in the 50s and 60s. This is, um, this is the blockchain development itself is stuck back decades ago, and there's been several, uh, there's lots of actually innovation that's happened that blockchain developers don't have access to. The, the sec third thing is that it is extremely risky to make a mistake. So not only is it harder to build, but when you make a mistake, you lose everything. Uh, developers don't want that risk, so that issue needs to be fixed as well. Um, and then the final thing is that blockchain itself is proprietary. Uh, you have the EVM, you have Rust, you have Teal, you have so many different types of technologies that you have to spend a long time learning that technology. And if you guess wrong, you lost years of your life. And that is a huge problem in this space. And all of those things need to be abstracted away with a single platform that allows for being able to deploy on everything. So you don't have to risk you know, all of that lost knowledge. Yeah, I guess for me, uh, sort of as Jerry said, I think some of the most interesting things in the space are sort of bridging the Web 2 and Web 3 uh, gap. I think we have a tendency to go all in on Web 3 and think that it's completely uncompromising and you know not really learn from some of the mistakes of Web 2. Like people forget that Web 2 existed in the first place because we had Web 1 where things were already decentralized, where a lot of that ownership was on the end users and it was just too much effort for most people. They wanted convenience, they wanted simplicity, they wanted safety and trust coming from a platform that could offer things. I think there is a role for that in Web3. I would argue we're already sort of at that point. Maybe we're already in Web4, where we're starting to see platforms that have you know, a distributed core to them, but they're offering things on top of that that you couldn't offer with the technologies themselves. Uh, one place that I think is really interesting and that I would love to see someone figure out in the future is insurance on smart contracts. I think for, you know, a lot of people, we look at insurance, and we're like, oh, what an oldie-timey financial concept. You shouldn't need that in the new fancy world. But in order to get people to trust something that is irreversible, at least being able to tell them, if there is a problem with this, and if you lose funds as a result or assets as a result, you have some way to at least reclaim part of it. Allow the common public to be able to hedge that in that way and make it seem a lot less risky than it currently seems to them. Because a lot of people just have opposition when they see all the news articles around Web3 being people that got fished and lost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, because they signed something that they shouldn't have because they were just, once again, clicking through things where all the UX looks the same. So yeah, I think introducing some of the sort of established older financial concepts into Web3 is a little risky to propose at a Web3 conference, um, but I really do think it does have a place and we should learn from the mistakes of the past and not necessarily eschew it just because it's old. Yeah, I agree that I think a hybrid model is going to lead to more adoption, you know, especially for people who are, are less comfortable in, in a Web3 environment. Um, I also think that there's a lot of risks and we need to figure out a way to balance, like, sticking to the core principles of what blockchain and crypto are for us while also managing those risks, whether that's, you know, making it easier for people to build without having, you know, super high gas fees. Um, because it's, it's just not going to be possible for people to make experimental, daring work, whether that's artistic or businesses, if the cost to entry is so high even to do one transaction and it's $600. It's just not possible. Uh, Jerry, just before I go, we st we'll still have a meet, uh, few minutes for questions from you. So if you're interested, just, just line up here and uh, we'll take the question. Jerry. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things holding back crypto is this sort of like um, the risk of doing transactions on the blockchain isn't particularly like well known to retail. In fact, I think if you ask the average real retail person what they think of crypto, um, if they've never used it before, uh, they'll likely say that it's very scammy. And for some people who have used it before, uh, they might have been victims of those scams or victims of things that like they thought were undesirable. If you saw, you saw like a 20% yield APY on Anchor protocol uh, on the Terra blockchain, uh, a lot of people are driven to that because they think it's a stable coin and 20% a year is like a ridiculously high yield, right? Um, but there's obviously a lot of risk associated with all of these things. And I think that like one thing that isn't 
quite clear and something that like is almost like an image problem that the crypto community needs to solve is sort of like uh, adding uh, an aspect that like even though you see these really high numbers and high rewards, there's risk associated with it. And making that sort of clear to the user, I think, is like somewhat important. Um, it, it's I think it leads to sort of sort of a bad reputation because I think there's a lot of like really innovative things going on in the space, but it's really hard to reconcile that with the fact that you see these things happen that uh, really affect normal people quite negatively. Excellent. That's that's a lot of interesting thoughts there. I mean, Chris, you started this uh, this uh, panel with challenging all of us, saying, "Hey, show me something where we have actually moved the needle uh, with blockchain uh, and related technologies." And then we heard about different ways where maybe hybrid solutions are still required uh, to make a difference, whether it's physical, digital, whether it's Web two, Web three, and I don't even know what Web four means yet. I barely understand what's Web three. Um, so some fascinating conversations. I think John is here to tell us the next panel is on. Thank you all. Thank you.